book of Hebrews, and I want to just kind of talk to you about one of the things they talk about, and um, I think it'll just kind of add to it, just kind of bring home what these boys are talking about, and it's a more abbreviated way that I'll be talking about it, but I, I, want, you, I want you to understand something, I, I want you to think about something. And we're going to start in verse 23 and go to verse 29. But I want you to start, I just want you to just think about something. Personal. Just personal. Just a real personal question. And, and the thing that, the thing that, that, that it really focused on and the thing that I think most gripped you in the beginning was that this man Esau had such a great opportunity. Like there was nothing stopping him. Nothing stopping him from being all that God wanted him to be and having all of God he wanted. But because he simply did this one simple thing, this one simple thing, and I think here in Hebrews 11, it kind of magnifies the most out of any other part of it. But because of this one simple thing, he valued, he valued other things more than he valued God. He valued and he put more importance on other things than he did his spiritual life. His spiritual life was not the most important thing to him. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, it really meant nothing to him. It really meant nothing to him. It really wasn't important to me. And I really think the thing that, that Jeremiah 6 really gripped my heart about was whenever they were talking about Jeremiah 26, and I think it's around verse 22 or somewhere, when they were saying that God, that God, listen to me now, this is God speaking to these people. Now God said that that sweet cane and, and those offerings, that, that they were the incense they were burning, You know, it was supposed to be like this, this sweet, 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 sweet offering to God. Yeah. You know, just like us, like, like the things that we do for God, it should be just so sweet. Like when we come in here, like we worship, like we worship on Sunday morning. And we, we I'm talking about we sing to God. And we uplift God through those words that we sing about His, his glory and His majesty and His salvation and His grace. And then the things we do for God throughout the week, they should just smell so sweet to God. But the point they made was this, and it was just the greatest point, that no matter how much you do of any of that, if your heart is not right with God, it stinks to him. Because it's hypocritical. He told a story, he told a story about um, this lady, and this guy, he, he worked at his workplace, and him and his wife were married, and, you know, they started having some problems, and so there was this lady at his work, and, you know, they just started talking, and I guess they started flirting, and he didn't think it would hurt anything, and, you know, just before long, you know, he's sleeping with his girl at work, and he slept with his girl three times. And the first time that he did, he felt so guilty for doing it, he went and bought his wife a ring. So he just walks in with a ring for no reason. Can you imagine someone going to drop it and drop it a grand on you and walking in just for work? So she was elated. She was so happy with it. She felt like things were turning around with him. But it was guilt. It was guilt was the reason he did it. He didn't do it out of love. He did it out of guilt. He did it out of you understand what I'm saying? Maybe he did some things out of, you know, it's what he was supposed to do. And then later on, you know, it happened again with that girl. And he went and bought all the appliances in his house. He'd been out of for 15 years to get it. He bought all the appliances. She just walks in one day and got all the appliances. Then it happened again his third time. 
And, you know, eventually this woman he's sleeping with at work goes and tells his wife, but she don't, she sees him leaving, don't like the arrangement. And, but before she talked to her, the third time, he bought a brand new car. So you just imagine you're having problems in your marriage, and all of a sudden he buys a, a big ring, he buys new appliances, he buys a brand new car. And she was so elated with those things. Until this girl from his work come and talked to him and told her. And she said, you know, every time he bought you one of those things, he had just left the bed with me. So the very thing that she treasured, the very thing that she appreciated, the very thing that was thought of as a gift, becomes something she hated and never wanted to see again. And so you see, we do things for God sometimes when we're being unfaithful to Him out in the world. But yet we feel like we're, you know, when we come in here on Sunday and come to church and we get put money in the offering or, or we do whatever things we do and we feel like we're good. Right. But God is like that lady. When he looks at it, it is not a treasure to him. It's something he hates because it stinks with unfaithfulness. Right. Yeah. Because listen to me, they used a couple of my favorite verses, verses that some people see as negative, but I feel very positive. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So if y'all would stand, we're going to read in Hebrews 11. I'm going to start verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was not a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was coming years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction when the people of God didn't enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, where he had respect as the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover, sprinkling of the blood, lest that destroyed the firstborn should touch him. By faith they passed through the Red Sea, as by dry land, which the Egyptians, the same to do, were drowned. Father, I just pray, God, that you would just take us and just grab hold of our heart and help us to just put you back in the right place and to be able to esteem the things of God yeah. again in our lives. And Father, if there's someone in here who's never been saved, that has never been born again, that is lost in their sin and on their way to hell. And Lord, they've been hesitant to come because of what they feel they're going to have to give up. I pray you'd, you'd help them to see the preciousness of the blood of Christ. Yes. And Lord, the righteousness of God. And Lord, the glory of God. And just how beautiful and wonderful you are above all things. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Y'all may be seated. Short background work today is on Moses. I want you to understand that Moses, you know, he was a Hebrew, he was a Jew. And they were down and they were in Egypt in bondage, but they were killing all the babies under a certain age because they were fearing the Hebrews were the uh, Egyptian slaves. They were fearing the Hebrews were getting too strong, so they started killing the babies, murdering the male babies that were born. So Moses' um, family took and put him in the river, and he was found by Pharaoh's daughter, and she saw him and fell in love with him and took him to be her son. And he was raised in the house of Pharaoh. He was raised in what was the ruler of the known world at the time. And he had the world at his fingertips. He had anything and everything you would want in the world to the max. He had an unlimited credit card, so to speak. He had the finest of clothes. He lived in the finest of beds. 
He could have his choice of any women in the kingdom. I'm just telling you, he lived in a place where the world would say was perfect. But listen to the statement that Moses made. Listen to the statement of this man who had everything the world had to offer. And if he made the choice, listen to me, there was no, there was no two-way street, and there's no two-way street for you today. There's no two-way street for you today. There's no one foot on one side of the fence. There's no one foot on the other. You're either in, in I'm telling you, the direct, complete will of God, or you are not. And either what you were doing pleases God in your life as a whole completely, or it is not. Yeah. Or it is not. But listen to this. This man with these things, he made this statement. He made this choice. It says, by, listen, by faith, Moses, when he come to years, I love this word. I love this word. I love this word. It didn't say he contemplated. It didn't say he had a hard decision to make. It didn't say he stuttered. And he probably stuttered if you read the rest of his life. It didn't say any of those things. It didn't say, you know, that he was thinking about compromising. He didn't say it bothered him. He, that he was worried about a choice he was making. He didn't say anything like that. He said he, said he refused. He refused. It's about time that God's church is lit on fire with the glory of God and we love and desire God so much we refuse to live like the world. Amen. We refuse right. to be satisfied with just being okay. We refuse to be satisfied with a mediocre prayer life right. and Bible study. We refuse to go a day without God. We refuse to put the world ahead of God. We refuse to be unfaithful to God because Moses said he refused to be called a son of Pharaoh. He refused. He refused. Listen. Choosing. 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 He had a choice to make. We all got the same choice. Oh, you might not live in Pharaoh's house, but you can live in the world. Yeah. It's two choices. You're going to live in the world because God said, if you're friends with the world, you're an enemy of his. Right. And to live in the world and to live in a worldly way is adultery to God. You're being unfaithful to God. It is an adulterous way to live in the eyes of God. But he said, choosing. It's just like all those men said and talk. What road have you chose to walk on? What life have you chose to live? And don't think about how you feel now and how it looks now. You look at the end of the road. That was the main part of that intersection yeah. sermon was, you look at the end of the road, man, it looked like, it looked like you would have felt sorry for Jacob Walking with a limp after he wrestled with God, you'd have felt sorry for Jacob because he had to leave his home because of fear of being killed by Esau. You would have felt like Esau should have had pity on Jacob because you felt that Esau was in a better, stronger position because he had all the things the world had to offer and had all this worldly strength. And so you look at your life now. You look at your life now and you feel as if, if you're living worldly, things are going good. But that was not the end for Esau. It ended in waste. It ended in destruction. That was not the end. You need to live your life. Moses lived his life in the beginning with the end in mind. What road Moses chose to walk on had nothing to do with the present. Because in the present time, he was sleeping in the palace. In the present time, he was eating the king's food. In the present time, he was rich. He walked away from every dime and dollar and thing he knew and person he knew just because he refused to be anything but the child of God Amen. he was called to be. That's right. Amen. So you have no excuse. You have no reason not to choose Christ ahead of the world. 
But it said choosing, look at what a choice he made. Rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. <clears throat> think about the way you think sometimes. You look at the people of God and you look at the lifestyle that a Christian has to live. Not when they're being a hypocritical person that says they're a Christian, but I mean when they really live. And you think about all the things in your life you would have to leave behind and all the things that would have to change. And you think, man, then I'll have to be faithful to church. Then I'll have to, I'll have to read my Bible. Then I'll have to live by the Bible. I can't do this thing I like to do. I can't sin and do these sinful things I don't want to do anymore. Look at the cost that it cost Moses. Look at what Moses headed to. He didn't sugarcoat it in his mind. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. If you're a Christian, God has called you to walk as the Bible says to walk and to walk with the people of God. Amen. And to be faithful and to serve God. You say, well, Brother Greg, it's hard. Look at this verse. This verse tells you you can do it. Look at this verse. This verse tells you you must do it. Look at this verse. The, the affliction and the degree of difficulty will not be a valid excuse before God. God is no respecter of persons. So anything God enabled Moses to do, to follow his will for Moses' life, what God wants for your life, he'll enable you to do. Amen. Choosing random to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy. It's not like he didn't really, he didn't know there was some enjoyment and pleasure in sin. Yeah, when you sleep with a woman, it feels good. Yeah, when you, you doing drugs, you feel good at the time. Yeah, when you drink it and knock it on back, you feel like Superman. Yeah, when you're out there blowing money and doing things, when you're doing all the things the world is doing, yeah, there's pleasure in them. But he was wise enough to understand what most people in the church don't understand. Look what he says. He says, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for what? He understood it didn't last long. He understood it didn't last long. He got it. He got it. You know why he was looking at the end of the road and not what his next step was, not how he felt right now. You cannot make this decision based on how your flesh feels right now. You've got to trust God by faith and walk with God by faith. Amen. And Moses Amen. trusted that God, God, would bring him more joy than the pleasures of this world because he understood that sin is only fun for a season. See, when you get out of school and you get my age now, I'm not 20 anymore, so I ain't just been out of school three years. Some of you are 20. You only been out of school three years. When you get my age, you start going to the funerals of all the people that have been addicted to drugs and done drugs from the time we were in school. You start, hey, you start going to funerals of people that committed suicide because they felt hopeless. Because why? They chose the road down the road of the world. They chose it. And they walked down that road and they ended up at the end of that road. That's where the end of that road took them. And I could have been that same exact person. But I know that the grace of God and the mercy of God allowed me to be saved. And thank God I chose to walk on the road with Christ. And no matter what it took, I walked on that road because I trusted God. And that's what you've got to do today. You've got to quit trusting how you feel. You've got to get trust in what, quit trusting what the world says and the picture they put on. You've got to start trusting God. Right. Yeah. Sin for a season. Some of you are enjoying the pleasures of sin right now. But it ain't going to last long. It ain't going to last long. And then look what he says. He's steaming, the steaming, the reproach of Christ. Greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. There, there is just no way to understand how much, how much Egypt was worth at the time. 
They're one of the world powers. They had an unending amount of riches. I mean, they built the pyramids. That's a heck of a statue. I'm just saying. That's a heck of a statue. They run around in chariots. Yet on fine clothes. But he esteemed the reproach of Christ. He thought more of God than he did the world. And that's a hundred percent of the place that I felt God wanted me to take you this morning to this one singular, 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 very narrow, narrow question. If you're being completely honest this morning, have you ever done what Moses did? Have you ever really, truly left the world behind and given yourself completely to God? Listen to this. Philippians 3 8. Listen to this. Could, can you say this? Can you say this? This is what Paul said. Listen to this. You say, man, you don't know what I'm going to be losing, Brother Greg. Can I tell you this morning? You're going to be losing nothing. You're going to be leaving trash behind. You know what you do with trash? You throw it away. You know why you throw it away? Because it's worthless. It's worthless. Listen to what Paul said. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. He's saying, I left it all behind. I left it all behind. Everything now. Everything. He left it all behind. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things. He said, but I, and this is a, a word, an accounting word. This is the word where he looked at the value of things. And he looked at the worth of them. And he said this. He said, I do count them but dumb. That I may win Christ. That I may win Christ. And what God said in Jeremiah chapter 6. Was that if your life ain't perfectly in the will of God. There's something God has told you to do and you ain't done it. If there's something God told you not to ever do again and you're still doing it, it stinks to God. Yeah. And until you get that right and you do what God has told you to do, if it's be saved, come and be saved. If it's, if it's you know, starting to serve, go on and serve. If it's starting to be faithful, more faithful, and, and being in the house of God, do it now. If it's stopping you cussing, if it's stopping you drinking, if it's stopping all of, you know, the sex outside of marriage, you know, just whatever it is he's told you to stop. And you ain't done it. All this other stuff don't mean nothing to him. Because obedience, the Bible says, is better than sacrifice. The man told a story, and I'll just close with this. The man told a story. And he talked about how, you know, in Baptist life, chewing gum used to be illegal in church. He said, I mean, you know, you started chewing gum, you started popping gum in the church. In the old days, when your mom and your grandma looked at you sideways, you might be told one whenever you leave. And then he asked a question, he said, was chewing gum really against the law? No. 
He said, but his daddy told him not to be chewing gum in church. And so when he did, it really wasn't about chewing the gum as much as what? He didn't do what his daddy said. Yeah. And see, that's where a lot of people are sitting in these pews today. You ain't done what your daddy said. You may be making a statement. Well, it's legal what I'm doing. It ain't a bad thing I'm doing. I mean, it's not in, it's, it's not in the world that I didn't do that that he told me to do. Well, yeah, it is the spiritual life. Right. Yeah, it is. And you know what he wants you to do? It's as old as time. It's as old as time. Adam and Eve, because they sinned, they ran from God and hid. They were running from God. But you know what God did? God came down in that garden. He started talking to them. He said, where are y'all at? Where are y'all at? And they knew it was the voice of God speaking to them. They knew it was the voice of God speaking to them. You know what God did? God went and made a sacrifice. And he called him a sacrifice until Jesus came. So when Jesus came and was, he died once for all, he finished it. His blood was enough. More than enough. And when Jesus came, the funny thing is, when Jesus came and walked on the earth, he used his word, and John the Baptist used his word alone. He said, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So repentance is as old as time. And God is telling you to repent. God is telling you to step out. Come down to an old fashioned old. And repent. It doesn't mean to say to God I'm sorry. It means get yourself up out of that pew. Walk in your own aisle. And do what Paul did. And leave it all behind. Give it, all, give it all of yourself to Christ. 100% again. If you can't say that's where you're at today, you need to come. You give him 99%. He ain't happy until he's got out of the way. It don't matter how big or little you think things in your mind. But God's been talking to you about something you are about been preaching, about the boys been talking. And you know what it is you need to do. So just listen to God. Follow the voice of God and come and get yourself right to God. Recommit yourself to God if you've got the way. You're not as on fire as you've ever been. Come today and recommit yourself to God. Just let God go to work in your life. You know, one of the things that God told me most was He said, Where Esau died is where his kids began. He left his kids on the border of waste. Where you die, you're going to leave your kids and your grandkids. That's where they'll start. So where are they taking them? What road are you on? Because they're walking with you. They're going with you today. And it's like they said at that crossroad with God when you meet him. You can just turn around and start going up and going the right way. Right now, this morning. Lord, we just thank you, God. Thank you so much for just gripping our hearts. And God, I just remember sitting in that, that church this weekend and you just tearing me apart, Lord. Just tearing me down and stripping me down of all my excuses. Of all my excuses. Where I just felt like it was just me and you in that place. You're speaking straight to me. Thank you, God, that you reached my heart and you touched my heart and I left there changed. And I pray today that for every person in this field today that we leave here closer to you, that we leave here on fire for you, that we leave here being that one word, God, that one word you want, and that's obedient, completely obedient to what you tell us to do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.